We're going to start with a four-step problem. We're going to find the probability of at least one. So take a moment to read this problem. Um, what you're going to find is that we have these false positives, they're called. Um, so the probability that somebody doesn't have HIV, but the test says they do, is 0 .004, so 4 in a 1,000. The statement of the problem that we're trying to figure out is if we test 200 people who do not have HIV, what's the chance, what's the probability that at least one false positive will occur? So we need to create a plan, and then we need to carry out that plan. So our plan is going to be that the trials are independent. That's something important because then we can find um, probability without having to worry about conditional probability. Um, and to find the probability that at least one that's going to equal one minus the probability of none. That's another important thing. So first thing we'll do is we're going to find the probability of no positives. In order to do that we need to know what the probability that we have a negative result. Well, that's going to be 1 minus 0 0.004. The probability that the test comes back negative is 0.996. So the probability that we have no positives would be 0.996 to the 200th. Because we have 200 trials, each with the probability of 0.996 coming back negative. Um, so what we get is 0.4486 rounded off. And now to find the probability that we have no, or the probability that we have at least one false positive, we're going to do 1 minus 0.4486 and get a probability of 0.5514 and the last part of the, our four step process is to conclude and we conclude that the probability is greater than one half that at least one of 200 people will test positive given these probabilities even though nobody has the virus So let's get into something called conditional probability. We're going to look at a formula for this. And it comes from, um, comes from our definition of probability where we have two events, probability of A and B. Probability of A times the probability of B given that A occurred. If we simply rearrange this formula, we find that the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A and B occurring simultaneously divided by the probability of A. So what we're really doing here, what this formula is finding us, regardless of what order the letters are in, it's the probability of both events divided by the probability of the condition. of this. That's what's going on the bottom. We know that that occurred. That's reducing our sample space to only where A occurred first. So let's solve a problem. What's the probability that a randomly selected resident who reads USA Today will also be reading the New York Times? Well, we're going to use our 
Venn diagram, and within our Venn diagram, we're going to apply our conditional probability formula. So let's translate this problem into a probability statement. Probability that they read the New York Times, so read New York Times as B, given that they read USA Today. We know that they read USA Today, so that's our given statement, so B given A. Our formula tells us, and what might help is actually write it with words, probability that they read New York Times when we know they read USA Today. So our formula says probability of A and B divided by probability of our condition, which is probability of A in this problem. So 5% on top, divided by probability that they read USA Today. That's this entire circle, not just the 35%, but it's 40%, and we get 0.125. So this is telling us that We know that they read USA Today, and that means that this stuff is now irrelevant, that our problem has been shrunken down to this simplified sample space from what it was before. Here we go, another four-step process, and we're going to be working backwards through a tree, di tree diagram. And we're going to come back to this um, internet and video sharing site example. And we looked at before whether or not adult users of various ages visited video sharing sites like YouTube. So 25% of internet users were from 18 to 25, 45% were from the ages of 30 to 49, and 28% above 50. So what percent of internet users who visit video sharing sites are aged 18 to 29? Let's translate this into a conditional probability statement. What this is asking us is we know that they video, visit video sites. So what's the probability that they're 18 to 29 given that they said video yes? So our conditional probability formula says that this is going to be probability of 18 to 29 and video yes divided by the probability of video yes. And when we're doing this, we get our information right out of our tree diagram. So 18 to 29 and video yes, so that's point one eight nine zero divided by the probability that the person does visit video sites. So let's see where that is in the tree. It's actually three different places. It would be that branch of the tree, that branch of the tree, and that branch of the tree. That's this entire denominator. So we need to add those things together and we get a probability of point four nine one three we divide this we get point thirty eight forty seven so our plan here involved using the tree diagram and our conditional probability formula right here our do was reading the numbers out of our tree for the numerator and denominator and recognizing that we actually have three branches for the video yes. And now we conclude by saying that about 38% of adults who visit video sharing sites 
are between 18 and 29 years old. And that's higher than the unconditional probability that 27% of adult internet users are between 18 and 29. So by saying that we know they visit video sharing sites, we can be more certain that they're in this particular age group. And that's where we stop today. We'll do plenty more of this conditional probability work as we practice problems.